Morning, everybody. Happy Saturday. Uh, this is the Ask a Painter Live show. I am the host of Ask a Painter Live. I am Nick Slavic. I'm also the proprietor of the Nick Slavic Painting and Restoration Company. Um, this is a show where I use my almost three decades of experience as a master crafts person, a business owner, and just a lover of the craft to answer any of your questions. We can talk about anything you want, but as usual, I come prepared with a topic. I want to make this time super valuable for you. Technically, this is family time for me. And it is for you too. And uh, if you're going to take a half an hour, an hour with me, I want to make sure that it's worth your while. So as I do, I have this awesome rhythm now where at the start of every year, I go through some mastering the basic stuff. So the number of questions and direct messages and emails that I get in December and January far outpace the rest of the year. Why? People are working on their businesses and they have these super hyper foundational critical questions about how all this stuff works. Um, so I go through a series called Mastering the Basics every year. Last week's show was on uh, job costing. I would argue the, the most foundational of all things uh, in business in general, not even just painting businesses. Now, today we're going to be talking about SOPs, Standard Operating Procedures, and we're going to continue with this Mastering the Basics series all through the month of January here. So buckle up. If you guys have any special requests, you can let me know. Otherwise, we are going to jump into this. We're on Instagram Live, we're on Facebook here, so I'll be jumping between the two, making sure I'm giving everybody uh, their their time to ans uh, excuse me, ask any questions, things like that. Otherwise, we're gonna hop into this, folks. So, all right, here we go. Let me do a screen share as we do here. Uh, Lucas, good morning. All right, so I'm gonna switch over. Uh, you guys let me know if, uh, if audio still comes through. Uh, IG people, Instagram people, if you wanna see the screen share, everything I'm doing here, Go over to Facebook. It's all there for you. All right, here we go. Let me make sure we're going here. All right, Mastering the Basics, Standard Operating Procedures. This is the 294th show I've ever done. We're at about five and a half years where I have not missed a week. I'm still planning my annual uh, From the Ice House, From the Ice Shanty uh, show here. So that'll be coming soon, but we're gonna hop in from the office and get a bunch of Mastering the Basics done here today. So. Boy, people have a lot of head trash about standard operating procedures. Um, it boggles my mind. So there's a lot of things in business that after doing them seem really easy. But if you haven't done them, they seem really hard. Um, this is something that seems really easy to me. And after doing it was really easy. So I think people have a lot of limiting beliefs and a lot of head trash about this sort of thing. We are going to dispel that. And at the end of this show, uh, well, actually not at the end, uh, in the show notes right now, I put my email address and I will give you all of my standard operating procedures. And I will also give you the two guides on how to make your own uh, to do that. So there is no excuse, folks. Success in business is grit and information. Congratulations. Here's the information. Do you have enough grit to actually get anything done with it? What are SOPs? SOPs are a set of written instructions that describes the step-by-step -step process that must be taken to properly perform a routine activity. The basis of this is I see tons and tons of comments on Facebook, the painter internets, as I call it. I have a painter uh, who's underperforming, or I believe they're underperforming. How long should it take a, 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 an experienced painter of five years to do X? And then I'll say, you need to back up 10 steps and say, do they know what to expect? You cannot reprimand. You cannot be punitive. You cannot scold. <laughs> and you can't even coach a painter until you have something written down for them to know what is expected. So the goal of standard operating procedures are consistency, compliance, and reducing variables. So the basis of all this stuff, and people say, hey, when do I know um, uh, I'm, I'm right? Uh, when, do you, when do I know I'm ready to hire my first painter? And I will say, if you don't have anything written down in your company yet, that is a fool's errand. I did it. And this is me being uh, hypocritical a little bit. If I had to do it over again, I would get all of these things in place before I hire somebody because otherwise, what are these employees supposed to know what to comply to? Standard operating procedures create consistency. They create compliance also with you know federal, state, local uh, regulations, safety things as well, and they reduce variables. So in any good scientific experiment, um, you need to reduce the variables so that you can actually figure out what's going right, what's going wrong. And if something is going wrong, you can correct it. So that's what a standard operating procedure is there to do. Now, quick notes. Don't forget these. This is probably the most important slide in the whole thing. 
I get so many emails, so many messages about people who say, I've been working on them for six months. I barely scratched the surface. I'm about to give up. And I will say, I created all the standard operating procedures in my company. I wrote them down in about an hour. So the only way that you should struggle with standard operating procedures, if you don't know how to paint, if you physically don't know how to paint a set of kitchen cabinets, you're going to have to find out or find somebody who does and then write it down. But if you know how to paint walls and cabinets and trim and the outside of a house and a deck, for God's sakes, write the steps down. It takes, we're going to do an experiment later on. It takes a few minutes to write that down. An SOP can be as simple as for bedroom walls, prep, top one, top two, D prep. Congratulations. That's an SOP that took a second and a half. You can obviously expand it from there, but please just do it. It should take you no more than 10 minutes to write down a standard operating procedure if you've ever done it before. Almost every single painter that I talk to, painter, business owner, knows how to paint. Just write it down. Don't think it has to be this crazy uh, thing that's cinematic, uh, videos, these crazy presentations, apps, software, things like that. You take a sheet of paper, you write down the steps, you now have a standard operating procedure. One of the mantras of my life is do not let perfect stand in the way of really, really good. I truly believe this and I live this. I would rather get a whole bunch of really good stuff done than nothing done because I'm a perfectionist. When I hear people say, well, I'm a perfectionist, I think you're setting yourself up to use that excuse later when you get nothing done. So these are living documents. I've changed these over the last five or six years countless times. I mean, you get to a point where you refine it and it's like, boy, it'd be hard to press. It'd be hard to change anything on here. But just start, get them down, change it as you go. Not a big deal. One other thing too is I get people saying, oh yeah, I have SOPs. I have standard operating procedures. I'll say, show me. Just show me where they are. And they can't. If it's not written down, it does not exist. Not for me, not for you, but for your people. If you say you have 10 people in your company and there's not a written SOP, and you can say, everybody in my company knows how to paint walls. We don't need to write it down. I will say, I bet you if I took all 10 of those people aside and had them paint a room, I bet you I'd find 10 different ways of painting a room. Now, when something goes wrong, how are you going to hold them accountable? That's their way. And unless you have something written down to say, well, listen, you missed number, uh, step number 13, then honestly, you have no leg to stand on in, in order to reprimand your employees or coach them or train them. SOPs are 100% useless alone. You have to then train people and then hold them accountable to it, which is the hard part. I've seen people create masterful SOPs. They, they take years to do it. They do custom videography, things like that. And then they never train anybody on it and they never hold anybody accountable to it. And guess what? 100% useless. Take that SOP, throw it in a file cabinet, never show it to anybody. You might as well not even have done it. Don't forget the human part of SOPs are the most important. The overarching thought I have in my head during creating standard operating procedures is how can I make the most happy clients on the face of the planet while making my employees most happy? I want them to get big wins. I want them to make beautiful finishes, uh, create happy clients, have satisfaction in their work, then making happy clients, then making the company more money, allowing me to take care of them a lot better. That's the overarching principles of this. All right, let me, give me one second. I'm just making sure all the audio video is good here. All right, thanks everybody. Thanks everybody for watching. Okay, let's get back to this. Now, what people don't tell you, which is super helpful to me, is uh, there are actually, in my mind, two forms of SOPs. There are the big standard operating procedures. These can be hundreds of pages long. They can be a few pages long. It doesn't matter, but it's detailed. The, the finite details of that, what brush, how to hold the brush, where to start on a wall. But then there's something which is super helpful called the SOP checklist. Oh, thanks for the thanks for the comment on IG, Steady. Um, yes, so SOP checklists are basically what I consider a one-page quick reference guide in the field uh, to to figure out what to do. Um, 
my thinking was, you know, in making standard operating procedures was if I just made a one pager for everything we do, we're going to leave out a lot of stuff. So that's not really useful. But also if we have a 160 uh, page PowerPoint slide on how to paint cabinets or trim, nobody's going to comply with that in the field. So again, simplicity is a hallmark of what we do. We have the monster SOP, the main SOP that has all the details. We go step by step, videos, pictures, everything else. We use that for training, maybe once a year, maybe twice a year. The SOP checklist, something we actually do is we print out those one pagers, which I will send to everybody. Uh, we laminate those, we put a ring in them, and we send them out in the field with all the apprentices and craftspeople, like a quick reference guide. And I'm going to show you examples of all this. So for me, there's two things here. I think people get bogged down with the main SOPs. Really, an SOP checklist is all you need, and then you can create training off that once you've proven it. So making an SOP checklist. Now, I, I am, this is one of the guides that I am going to send you if you email me. If, uh, if a process produces a reliable result each time, it's worthy of creating a standard operating procedure checklist so that the knowledge experience can be standardized in the field. Major steps. So step one in creating an SOP checklist is creating major steps. As quickly as you can, write down the major steps only. So I use the example of a bedroom all the time, which is prep, top one, top two, deprep. Congratulations, that's an SOP checklist. Now for an apprentice or somebody who hasn't been in the trades their whole life, you're gonna have to give them some more info to that. So then we write down the minor steps of that. So within prep, we have drop cloth, patching, tape, and switch plates. In top coat one, the major bullet point is one wall at a time, cut clockwise, roll left to right. Top two, same process. And then D-prep, the minor steps are tape and masking, switch plates, drop cloths, vacuum sweep dust, our white glove cleaning. Now you put in related tasks in there. So you have your four main steps, you have a whole bunch of your minor steps. And now what I do is I add in other things to make sure that that job is successful because if the first step of your SOP is prep, there's a lot that happens between when that painter pulls up to the house and when they start prepping a room. So what I do is I add in, put in a yard sign, unload the vehicle, set up a job site, verify the scope, colors, and finishes, and then make a project plan. And then at the end of the job, same thing too, fill out uh, how much paint used, how much hour used, and then pack up the vehicle. So supported and related tasks. But these things you can see, if you start trying to just get this out of your head right away, you're probably going to miss a step. I start with major steps, add in minor steps, add in related tasks, and then you have this thing at the end, the wall painting SOP checklist. And I like them as checklists because uh, we laminate them, like I said, and you can actually use dry erase, erase markers in the field and start checking them off like that. Making a full SOP. So I make a full SOP only after I make an SOP checklist because in a full SOP, all you have to do is take the, like I use the example of my exterior uh, SOP checklist, take the step. And on this step, uh, and on this SOP, I highlighted step number 10. I make one PowerPoint slide for every step in the process to physically show somebody there's going to be images, there's going to be videos and things like that, but I don't make it complicated. I try to, I try to put limits on myself to say, when we make a full SOP, if there are 27 steps in this thing, I'm probably only going to put about 27 slides. Now, some, some might need more, uh, more or less than that, but you basically want to go through that step. When it says uh, plastic and mask miscellaneous items, just like I have here, all of a sudden we can get into great detail because this is something we're going to use as a group in person, maybe even on site to train people in that stuff. Now, here's the interesting part. <laughs> You document each step, usually one slide, and then the most important part is the training and accountability side. So with the training thing, we subscribe to a process called DORAGI. Demonstrate, observe, redemonstrate, assign a task, goal set, and then inspect. So training's best done one-on-one -on -one with a trusted employee that knows the SOP in and out, if you can. Uh, this takes time. Make sure to retrain every often to refresh uh, the minds of the trainees. Um, we're doing this uh, currently this year. We're going to be doing some refreshing because I train people, those people train people, those people who are trained, trained, then are training other people and you get a game of tel telephone going. And sometimes the finite details of this about, you know, a certain way to mask a corner of baseboard like this using a, a painter's tool like that can get lost because of this game of telephone. So that's basically how we, uh, how we take care of that. Now, accountability. Make following the SOPs part of the rating system you use to compensate your employees. If they don't follow the SOP, 
no raise or you lose your job at some point. Um, I actually have one sheet in my company called the standards. And on that sheet, it says, do these and you keep your job. I set the, the minimum bar of things you must do in this company to retain uh, your employee status here. You have to show, all right, now, great example for you is when, when there are some problems on site, like let's say some things aren't getting done, there's callbacks, there's things like that. The way that I hold people accountable in the field is I take my own set of laminated SOPs and I show up in the field. And you don't have to surprise, you don't have to do anything else, but basically when I show up on a site, I take out my wall SOP when they're painting walls and I just say, show me what step you're on right here. And they'll say, hey, we're, we're on top coat two right now. I'll go all the way to the start. Step number one and say yard sign and say, okay, number one, where's your yard sign? And if it's outside, we say, good. Now we're going on to step two and then step three and then step four. And what I find a lot of the time is that, oh yeah, you know what? We didn't, we didn't put a yard sign out. Sorry. It's in the van. We'll just go do it now. Or you know what? We couldn't find them in the shop. So then we go back and we get it and we make sure, but you're just verifying that every step was done in order. And when people know that's coming or they think it might be coming, they're going to act differently like that. And it's just holding people accountable. It's keeping honest people honest. The goal of accountability is not to punish people. It's to ensure they do the work they can be proud of. You make happy clients and progress in the craft and in their career. You use SOPs for coaching moments, not for punitive action against your people. You can wield it positive or negative. You can use it for a weapon for good or a weapon for bad. I use it for coaching techniques. Absolutely. And I strap my bags on. And if somebody uh, is having trouble taping corners, like I mentioned, I'll get down there and I'll physically show them, have them do it a few times, show them again. And uh, we progress from there. So that's making a full SOP. Now, let me just check Facebook. Let me check all this other stuff. Make sure. Oh, yeah, we got some good viewers. We got some good questions. Holy mama. Uh, Terrence James, morning from Cincinnati. Go Bengals. Uh, I don't watch sports. I assume that's a football team. Good luck today in your sports games. Brian Santos, how's it going, man? Carlos, how's it going, man? It took me 30 minutes to do a Spanish SOP for walls. I guess it took too long. No, man, you're good. Listen, it's it's a little bit hyperbole, hyperbole just saying do it quickly. But honestly, I think people have a lot of head trash and limiting beliefs about this stuff. Um, Carlos, if you're ever interested, I would love to translate my SOPs uh, into Spanish uh, and, and disseminate them out there. So if you're ever interested, let's work together and get that done. I think that could be a really cool thing. Anthony Cade, we taped our room painting uh, one of our equipment tote last week, and I don't think anyone read it. <laughs> My fault for not going over it with them and making sure they're using it. Exactly. You need to physically be there and do that. Now, the good thing about these SOP checklists in my company, we just had 10 people start uh, January 3rd and go through our two-week apprenticeship program. Every one of them was given a laminated SOP packet. It's very likely two months from now, they will have it committed to memory and they don't need it. Great. That's all I care about. I, I don't care that these things aren't being used, but once they've committed to muscle memory and memory memory, uh, it'll be good. Jonathan Rinaldi, working on SOPs this week. So I would challenge you guys... <laughs> I would challenge you guys, if it takes you more than two hours to make a couple Word documents on this stuff, you're overthinking it. Bang it out. It'll be 90% complete and then refine it after that. Tanner, love this, man. Love this. Uh, so much value. Also, uh, if you guys didn't catch uh, Tanner and my podcast and the live stream uh, in his Facebook group, uh, I love Tanner. He's a super bright young thinker and uh, yeah. Uh, it's what our industry needs more guys like Tanner. So the asterisk at the bottom is key. You got it, man. <laughs> uh, Mike Miller. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Uh, Michael Cheney. What exactly is your project plan? Is it something that is written down, assigns tasks to individuals? So a project plan is this, we work for 10 hour days. And, uh, in that 10 hours, I want people just to show me what steps of that SOP they're going to get done that day or how many versions, like if you're going to paint two or three rooms in a day, tell me what you're going to do that day in order to get this project under budget. So the simplest version is this, we work four 10 hour days, right? Every week, if a project is 40 hours, I want you to show me each of these four days, what's going to get done to get this project under budget. And I can help. It's a Google document. We can work on it together. It can be as simple as you know, uh, all I ask of my people is when they paint a bedroom, just tell me how long did it take you to prep top one, top two, deep prep those four bullet points on something like that. And the same thing can be done for cabinets. If you're going to do this set of kitchen cabinets, maybe prep is an entire day or a day and a half. Maybe top coat is, I mean, honestly, I put out videos of me spraying a, a set of kitchen cabinets with four and a half minutes. So basically that's what I want to know what's going to get done. And honestly, uh, Michael, it's not necessarily about the individual steps. 
and the number tracking, because you can use that for production rates and things like that. It's more important that these young people look at this project and physically think more of what's in front of them at that moment. I want them to think out to the end of the project and sequence it and figure out how to get this thing done. Um, yeah. It's a, it, it's, it makes people have a little more futuristic thinking than they normally would. So, all right, let's see what else we got here. Maurizio. Ah, bonjour, my friends from Brazil, Tony Joseph. Thank you so much. Clyde Samso. Good morning. Frankie Pie, Frankie and County Kerry in Ireland. Oh man. How's it going over there? I love it when, uh, you know, Lucas and Frankie and, and Joseph from, uh, um, Australia, all over the world. This is so fun to connect with people. So Frankie, if you're ever interested, send me some pictures of your job sites. I always love seeing what people do in foreign countries. So, all right, we need it in Spanish in New Jersey. The labor force is 99% Spanish. Uh, interesting data point for you, Tony. Um, uh, I've heard a stat that 55% of the entire painting industry is uh, non-English Spanish speaking. So honestly, if I was going to serve the industry better, these would be in Spanish. <laughs> so uh, if anybody's interested in translating for me, I would absolutely love it. And I would be uh, in debt to you uh, if you would do that. All right, Ed Moritz, um, listen. You know the thing. I have my email address here. What I will not accept is you saying, send me those things. You must take my email address, put it into your email, whatever email you use, send me a thing and say, hey, Nick, watch the show. I'm looking for the SOPs. Remind me what you're looking for. If you just send me an email and say, hey, it's Ed from Facebook, I'm not going to respond. I will give you everything I have, but you have to email me and you have to say, hey, I saw the show, send me the SOPs. And I will. I'll ask for something very small in return, which is a review, uh, and to pass it forward and like and share the show, but I will send them to you. Uh, Garrett, good morning. Uh, Carlos, I will shoot you an email. I can translate. Yes, I love that. All right. Brian, we teach a system of ACT, accountability, uh, accountable communication transparency by stating that managing these precepts, it puts people on all the same pages. Absolutely. I absolutely love that. So, all right, let me make sure we do, 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 don't have any questions on IG before we proceed here. Thank you all for watching. I love that. We got a lot of people watching this morning. Dominic Crowley from across the pond as well. Happy New Year. Uh, thank you so much, man. And uh, I was watching some of your videos this morning on IG. I love watching you spray, man. One of the best podcasts I've heard in a while, Top Line Painting. Thanks a lot, man. I appreciate that. Jason Paris, send me a shirt. All right, Paris, I just gave you a shirt and I saw it sitting in your office chair, in your office with the tag still on. So you show me you're using the shirt, Jason Paris, that I've already given you and I'll send you another shirt. All right. Deal. <laughs> Love that Jason Paris, man. Uh, David Cusson, uh, Canada. All right. Awesome. Okay, here we go. Proceeding. Proceeding. All right. So what can you standardize? Uh, I'm going to show you some examples uh, of these things uh, just so you can understand um, what we're doing. Now, people think of SOPs as painting stuff, but it's not always painting stuff. When I make an SOP checklist like this, like this is my most used and most famous one, the four hour bedroom. I actually lay out, I like to, to have people visually see the yellow part here is prep. The green part is painting and the blue part is deprep. prep. And I actually assign time periods. So prep should take an hour and a quarter. Uh, in a bedroom, uh, painting should take about two hours and cleanup should be about three quarters of an hour. Now, if you guys want to see this in action, I actually have a live bedroom that I painted on Facebook years ago. So if you search Nick Slavic bedroom or ask a painter bedroom in two and a half hours, I paint a bedroom start to finish in front of all my apprentices while answering questions from the internet. And I follow every single step of my SOP. I've actually taken that video, broken off into the steps and using it for my wall training SOP when we onboard people in the company. Cabinets. So I broke this off in a couple of years ago into what happens at somebody's house and what happens to the doors and drawers. Since we have a, f a finishing facility, uh, one of the first tasks we do is, is take the doors and the drawers off in the house and get them back to our finishing facility ASAP so we can start working on those things. Since we lay them flat, we have to do three coats on one side, three coats on the other side, I mean, your typical one prime or two top coat. And um, in the past, those things have always held us up because uh, craft people and apprentices on site would have to not only get the site ready, but then make trips back and forth from the shop, our finishing facility, in order to, you know, uh, do the doors and drawers. So now what we have is we have our shop manager 
and his squad of apprentices uh, take care of most of the finishing uh, stuff on there. So uh, uh, in the shop and then our, our craftspeople and apprentices take care of the job sites. And people always ask, well, what happens when your job site crew runs out of time and this and that? And honestly, our jobs are big enough. There's other stuff to do in the house. It's not a big deal. Um, once in a while, when we get in a pinch, the job site crew will actually go back to the shop and do it too. But that's that's a rarity. So I actually break off the SOP between you know what happens on site and what happens in the field. Trim. So trim is basically the, the process is no different than cabinets, but you guys know from doing large whole house trim projects, there's a lot of little stuff between windows and doors and floors and all this other stuff. There's lots of ways that that can go wrong. So what I love about the trim SOP is you can see the yellow part is three quarters of the entire SOP. It's all prep. There's a little bit of painting in the middle and then deep prep. So uh, interesting. Trim to me is more of a headspace and limiting belief project than it is an actual painting project. Ceilings. Um, I actually broke this out a couple years ago as well, too, between when we're doing walls and ceilings and when we're not doing walls and just doing ceilings like that, because we, we prep the walls and the room a little bit differently. Exterior SOP checklist. So um, I get a lot of pushback on, no, I, should, I shouldn't say pushback. I get a lot of questions about this one because people say, well, listen, every house is different. There's stucco, there's hardy board, there's wood. Listen, folks, this is not an SOP for a specific substrate. This is a theory SOP. The, the theory of what we do is prep, remove any failed coatings, make sure we apply something that will either stick or stop bleeding, which would be a primer. We put some sort of protective coating on and then we clean up. You could extend that to cabinets. You could extend that to walls. You can extend it to Victorian restoration or a deck. The theory of what we do is all the same, those basic steps. The specifics of the substrate will let us kind of call audibles and do other things. Deck SOP checklist too, uh, which is another one. Uh, again, very simple, very straightforward, 16 steps, everything from yard sign to loading up the gear at the end. Uh, estimating. So again, like I said, it's not just painting stuff. Um, in order to help uh, my leadership team understand what's expected of them, we actually have estimating SOPs. And again, people email me and say, oh my God, send me that estimating SOP. It does not tell you what to charge people. This is the theory and the steps of what to actually do. It starts from assessing a lead that comes into your company, making initial contact, getting ready for the estimate that you scheduled. You do the estimate with the person. You present the estimate. Then you start updating CRM, Google Drive, Sales Tracker, and then you track the estimate on Trello. Uh, then if they do say yes to the estimate, we hand it off and there's a procedure for that. And then there's also a procedure for weekly, uh, uh, meetings and sales meetings and things like that. So again, this is not going to be the end all and be all for you because the price is going to be dependent on a completely other SOP, which is that, you know, estimating Bible that I, that I made for the company, but it lets people know that this is the process when something goes wrong. Like the typical thing that goes wrong in the lead sales production process is we'll get an email from a client say, Hey, listen, I haven't heard anybody from a while. What's going on here? Uh, nobody's contacting me. And then we can actually go back to the SOP and say, okay, we gave you the estimate and we were supposed to follow up 24 hours later. I'll go talk to estimator Andy and say, where's the email that says you followed up 24 hours later. And he'll normally pull it up and say, here it is right here. And I'll say, oh, that's interesting. I see it there. It went to the client. So we can then contact the client and say, listen, you got to check your spam box. You got to check junk. You got to check something because we sent you an email. Here's a screenshot. And then normally the client will say, oh yeah, there it is in my spam box. So that SOP allows you to track down. If something does go wrong, you can actually go step by step and figure out where it is. When we get a callback on jobs, typically we're three to 4% on all projects. When we get a callback, I can guarantee you either a step was missed or a step wasn't done 100% and we can find it, pinpoint accuracy, and then fix it in the future. Production. So this is my production team standard operating procedure too. So there's pre-job setup. Um, there's during job setup. Um, there's work in progress. Uh, there's job closeout, and then there's administrative work. Now, what you're going to find is that this estimating SOP and this production SOP, this is basically the steps of their job description. And they are incentivized by doing these steps. So again, when, when a project doesn't go as well as we want, we can actually look back at this and find exactly where we could have done better. So a full SOP. So I'm going to share this with you guys now, what a full SOP looks like. So, all right, let me make sure we're not burning over any questions here. Holy mama, thanks everybody. Mark Adams, thanks a lot. Ted Scharf. 
It's great that business owners treat new employees as investments. With that being said, the employee overtime when treated fairly will realize that when they are invested into the business, I should be a mutual beneficial situation. Oh yeah, of course. That's the golden rule. <laughs> Brian Chemnitz. Nick, you got me going on SPs about a year ago. It was the best move I've ever made. Thank you. But we did change the name to BKMs, best known method, urban dictionary for BK. <laughs> Dude, I love it when people innovate with stuff like that. So I, because I put a lot of stuff out into the industry, we do some unique things in our company. Like we call our production people and our project managers, client concierges, because we want to be pretentious and, and show that we give a higher level of service. But there are things like SOPs where I have to keep them the same name so that it's a universal, so that's a touchstone for everybody within the industry and without. So yeah, I, I love that innovation of stuff like that, man. Um, Ted Scharf, you know, Ted will definitely wear a shirt proudly and push $2 million of your work in your direction. <laughs> Chris Sherist, uh, what is your method to teach your employees to follow the SOP list in a way they follow it in a positive way and in a way that's productive? So there's two ways, which is you need to create a warm family environment in your company. It makes them feel safe and learn. And you also need to tie it to their pay. Uh, there is there is the way where it's like, hey, do this or you're not going to get a pay raise. But also, I'm going to break myself to train you. And I, I take a, a, a definite interest in you. You got to have both of those things there like that in order to keep honest people honest. Anthony Cade, paralysis by analysis. That's exactly it, man. Sumter. Uh, thought on how to first introduce concept of SOPs to tenured employees who are set in their ways. This is a great question. Have them write them. Sit down with them and just say, hey, listen, we need to get this stuff on paper. Walk me through the exact steps on the standard operating procedure. I don't know drywall and I don't know carpentry. When we started drywall division years ago, um, I took a senior drywall person. I sat him down, just said, walk me through the process. I'm going to write it down with you. And then at, over the years, we've adapted that sort of thing. Include them in it. Nothing feels better than being included and having a valued sort of uh, um, uh, a, a valued exchange with somebody. Um, they have this knowledge and let them feel valued for that knowledge and let them contribute to the process. So, okay. Alex Garcia, what program software do you use to make your SOPs? Again, folks, it's all Google. It's all G Sheets. It's all free and it's all there. So no excuses. It is all there. Sorry, what is SOP list? An SOP checklist is a one page step-by-step -step process to do something. The full SOP, which I'm going to show you now, is the long, long process that you actually train people on like that. So before I jump into that, let me make sure I didn't hop over any questions. Ah, Sean's cabinetry. Great live. Love that you're committed to training and improving the flow. Absolutely. Okay. I'm going to show you guys what a full SOP looks like now. And I'm going to use my deck one because uh, this is a shorter one. Otherwise, we'd be here for a long time. So let me pop this up. Let me do a slide share. All right. Decks, fences, play sets, SOPs. This is actually a picture of the deck at my old historic home like that. And uh, there's nothing more satisfying to me as a master craftsperson than seeing tight water beads on a freshly oiled deck. So Basically, what you're going to find here is um, every slide, I, I limit myself to one slide per step of an SOP. So you can see, let's go all the way down to doo, 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 doo. step 16 is the last step in this. So there's basically going to be 16 or so slides like this. Step one is the greeting and the verification stage of this. So the crew leader greets the client, you introduce, you hand them a calling card, uh, verify the scope and the project, make sure we're doing this deck with this stain and this process, the colors, the finishes. Uh, we actually have something called the jump sheet, which is our work order, which they verify all this stuff on. And they throw in a yard sign in the yard. Create a project plan. So Michael, you were asking about this. This is another G sheet. It's attached to our jump sheet. Uh, it's two tabs at the bottom, where basically if this is a two and a half day project, just show me how you're gonna use those two and a half days. And yeah, we'll figure it out after there. So uh, step number three, we need before pictures. So again, this is what we started with, a new deck up here, all, all brand new wood like this. Um, and we want all the, all the sides, all the images, again, um, just like when we talked about job costing uh, previously, you want to be super thorough and you got to make sure your people are being held accountable to these things because especially when we do exterior jobs, we're looking for paint on the siding, paint on the landscaping from previous painters so that we're not being uh, held uh, accountable for that sort of thing. Set up a job site. So again, everything we have is in a tote system like this. We set it down and there's actually a SOP for how to do it, where to do it, things like that. This is how we go in 
in depth of this, we usually lay a drop cloth down and this, I think we're in a, a gravel driveway, so you don't necessarily need to do that, but you lay it out in a form where it's easy to get at. We move the client's personal items. Um, everybody is doing this. So we're looking for lawn furniture, landscape ornaments, hoses, grills, toys, things like that. And again, I even put uh, some tips here from lessons learned. Some things are keep items off the lawn because uh, we'll, we'll wash a deck on a Friday or a Thursday. And then a client will say Saturday, hey, you, my grill's in the middle of the yard. I'm gonna mow the lawn, come back here and move it. And that's a problem. So we put it somewhere where in the landscaping, somewhere away from the deck. Also, we don't stack the stuff underneath the porch or the deck. Why? Because when we wash it, we're gonna get all these chemicals and all this uh, old wood chaff and, and old fibers all over this stuff. So again, lessons learned from years past. Seven, we cut trees and bushes back for ease and safety. All right, now we actually have a decision tree for a deck prep process. Uh, we have a process of stripping and of brightening. And basically uh, it's just something for our people to follow. It's got our chemicals, our ratios and things like that on it. We actually show images of our uh, prep cart. So this is us uh, uh, using our chemical prep cart. There's actually a, uh, a motor, an electric motor, 120 volt uh, fluid pump in there. And we have a hose and siphon and all the gear. And we actually put it in an all-terrain cart so that we can drag the whole thing around the house. We wash houses with this. We wash decks with this. Super simple, super easy. One person can lift this sucker up and put it in a van, no problem. It's a wonderful thing. So we actually have videos then uh, of people applying brightener. So we'll see if this comes across. Yeah, there we go. So in the SOP, sometimes I like to throw in that because... When it says apply brightener, I like to show people how we saturate, how we soak a deck, things like that. It shows an actual master crafts person actually doing it like this. So that's a really, really useful thing for people just to understand like, this is what it looks like when we say apply brightener. You can hear that pump working too. It's really cool. And then uh, we scrub. So one of the keys to our super simple deck restoration process is saturating that wood. You can see the wood is completely saturated here. And then we use, um, you can use a pressure washer if you want to take this stuff off a little bit. But I prefer the agitation method because people have a tendency to take a pressure washer and completely try to like turn that stuff into drip. So what we do is a gentle agitation like that. That's not sad. Beautiful thing right there. All right, and then we rinse. So after you go through the uh, the cleaning process, the scrubbing and the washing process like that, then we rinse the rest off like this. So this is a deck that was really cool. Uh, a homeowner had actually applied some sort of like cooking oil to the deck, some organic oil and any organic oil, if you guys understand the chemistry of it all, uh, mildew loves to eat oil, actually. Oil is a great food. Uh, for that stuff and uh, all the deck turned black. So basically uh, we scrubbed it a little bit, but really a gentle, gentle rinse just popped all this old black sort of uh, uh, mildewed oil up off there. You can see the image on the left too here, how uh, we go from, this is actually a deck strip. We use a chemical stripper on this and then you can see the bright new wood we turned it to uh, versus that. And then wash home in the surrounding area. So again, this is a very important part of this, which is you're gonna get little wood fibers soap and everything and all the stuff so we start top to bottom we rinse all the stuff off the house again as anybody who's done this before um, if you let some uh, dried wood fibers from a deck uh, stick to a grill or patio furniture or the side of the house they basically super glue themselves there and are very possible to get off so uh, step number nine we check moisture so we actually have digital moisture readers uh, again I, I steal a term from Eric Reason, test don't guess. <laughs> if, if you had a little dew on the deck this morning, uh, get out there, jab it with a, a moisture meter and uh, see what it is. Then you can actually, one of our processes taking pictures of this, uploading it to the file. So then we have a record when the client says, hey, listen, it rained two days ago. I don't think my deck was uh, good enough to, to do. And I say, well, listen, anything under 15%, we're good to go. This particular deck on top was 13%. Interestingly enough, I, I throw in this picture down below to teach my people that uh, the picture on the left here is 39% moisture, which is basically soaking wet. This is the side of a shed that's shaded. It would rain the night before and everything else. I jabbed a living tree and a living tree was 39% moisture. So basically that shed had, had enough juice and, and water in it, just like sap in a, in a living tree. So I think that's kind of a cool thing. And then we sand. 
Um, we sand lightly. Now, we're not grinding a deck down to round over all the edges. What we're doing, if, if we get our chemical right, if we scrub it, if we rinse it right, there's only going to be a little fur, a little fur, because we raise the grain with water. We're just knocking that down. We're not grinding any finish off or things like that. This is just to make it smooth to the touch. So I include, uh, this is actually a project we did for this old house years ago. Once the deck is washed, we'll give it a day or two to dry. We'll use moisture meters to test the level of moisture in the deck. If it's dry enough, we'll use a series of random orbital Light sand like this. And so sanding sponges. Normally we don't have drones we'll taking footage deck. of all our SOPs. After we're done we're, sanding, uh, yeah, we'll use uh, awesome leaf blowers, vacuums, rags, we brooms to get all of that dust and process. debris so You can also the search out that video get it ready for stain. It's a pretty cool thing. All right, and then we remove the dust from the deck. So again, we actually have leaf blowers where after you sand, there's going to be a little bit of dust on there. We actually use leaf blowers to clean off the entire deck because it's a quick way to do it. You can certainly use brooms and other stuff, but we actually physically show somebody doing this so somebody has a picture in their head of what they're doing. And then we site prep. So we actually show pictures. Now, this particular deck had a shed tucked underneath the deck. So again, we use heavy canvas, not plastic because if the wind kicks up, that stuff's all over the place. But I like heavy canvas. There's a little concrete stoop down here. So we, uh, we laid a drop cloth there. And then uh, we laid drop cloths underneath this whole concrete patio underneath there. And then typically when we work around uh, bushes and stuff like that, right before we stain a certain side, we'll slide a, a canvas in there and maybe pull the bushes back a little bit. But uh, yeah, that's normally how we do it. Uh, apply the coating. Now, applying a coating is a very general term. How do you do it? Where do you do it? We actually have a process of two people doing a deck where one person's on the outside of the spindles or the balustrade and one's inside and they work in tandem inside and out around the whole thing to keep a wet edge first. And then we do the floor on the way out. 100% saturation and wet edge. So we show some people uh, some really particular uh, steps here that will make success. So Wet edge, which means you don't do half the deck down the middle and then the other half because you're going to get a huge lap mark. Just like our master craftsperson, Alex, here, this deck we stripped to bare wood. So he at that time, he was only doing about a board at a time because it was so saturated. And here's a deck uh, that I was doing, too, where you can see existing finish was in pretty good shape. And this is what total 100% saturation looks like, which is you basically can't put on any more. Applying the coating, you can see here spindles first. Eric, one of our craftspeople, is working his way right through here. And when we work with an apprentice, sometimes they uh, they do some other stuff, but leave him a path out the middle there. And then uh, stairs. Stairs is actually a pretty uh, a pretty interesting process. So we do the skirts on the side. Uh, we do the risers uh, there, the, the the parts here. We can do this. A stair can be done with two people. If the first person coming down, you work in tandem, both coming down. The first person does the risers, which are the up and down parts. The second person is standing on the treads and then doing the treads as they come down. It's a safe way to do it. If you don't do that, one person is going to take about two hours to do the entire stairs while the other person doesn't have anything to do. Job site cleanup. Again, we show a picture. This is what it looks like. Take out your trash bags, put it all in there, and then throw it away for the client. And then job site closeout. So again, we want to label the paint cans. We want to get after images. We want to update our jump sheet project plan, things like that. We load the gear. We actually show people what a standard van load looks like and clean. And then we can also go through some coatings and things like that too. So that is basically a full SOP, give or take. Now let's go through here again and let's start looking up uh, do, 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 do. Annie Newton, top of the morning. Annie, love Annie. If you guys never talked to Andy in the industry, one of the brightest minds ever. So Chad Devereaux, when you use subcontractors, do you expect them to follow the same SOP? So for legality reasons, there's a lot of things you can and can't do with subcontractors. But one of the things that we do is if we sell a job, um, we promise a thing to a certain client and we just asked our subcontractors, can you deliver this certain thing to a client to our standards? Because it has to be aligned with what we actually promise the client. So, yeah, in, in a way, uh, it's a self-selecting process of them. So, Rodrigo, my friend from Brazil. Nick, this is one of my favorites. Use some uh, nuclear cleaning product not available in Brazil. <laughs> no, actually, you know what's funny is uh, we use um, oxalic acid, which technically is just the stuff they put on sour candy. So we use a super gentle process where we don't even kill plants or anything with this stuff, but it's just powerful enough to change gray wood to bright wood again. So uh, da, 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 da. 
Gustavo, what grit are you using to sand the deck? I like, so for really rough decks that are kind of old, you know, 20, 30 year old deck, we go 80 grit. Otherwise I like your 120, 150, uh, somewhere right in there. If you go any higher than that, you're just polishing a deck and you're going to burn up sanding paper. So, all right, Dave Pine. Okay, well, looks like I've got some work to do. Made our SOPs last year. Love the full SOP, complete with videos, uh, lights, camera, action. That's right, man. So, all right, so <clears throat> here, here is what, uh, da, 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 I will get rid of this. All right, I think I've gone through all the questions here. I think what I'm going to do is share this. This is a Google document right here. So I'm basically gonna show you how you should write your SOPs. Um, <laughs> this is the pace at which you should be writing your standard operating procedures. So if you think about, oops, if you think about, we're gonna go bathroom, all repaint. So that's gonna be our SOP. I do this to show you that it doesn't have to be anything more than this. So I tell you what, I'm looking at the ratio of the screen here. I think what I will do is bump this up a little bit. So everybody can see, bam, there we go. Okay. And we will basically just do a numbered guide. So basically we would, okay, let's start with this. So prep, top one, top two, deep prep. Look pretty. Now in prep, first we're gonna do floor protection because we're going to be working on the floor then i will patch walls why patch walls at that point because we got to get that patch to dry uh, then while we're doing that we will tape mask trim and then we will move switch plates now at this point because it's um because it's particular to a bathroom, I'm going to insert another one, which is plastic over vanity, plastic over stool, toilet, plastic over shower, tub. Now, and because it's a bathroom, we're going to do remove towel, bars, etc all that other stuff in there. So top one, top two, and deep prep. So top one, we'll go start with door wall. I always like to start my processes and go clockwise from the door we walked in. Cut wall at a time. Roll one wall at a time, clockwise. And because this is basically the same process, we are going to go copy. If you know how to paint a bedroom, folks, this is all it takes to write an SOP for this stuff. All right, and then deep prep. So first thing we're gonna do is remove the tape so it doesn't stick to our wall. Replace, Actually, we'll go up here in plastic as well because that'll get rid of the stuff off all the vanities and stuff. Place switch plates, place towel bars, etc. Thing, yep, that looks good. Remove drop cloths. White glove clean. And this can be wipe down hard surfaces. not sweep, sweep. Sweep vacuum floor. And then we go load van, jump sheet, project plan, update Slack. You've labeled paint cans. That's it folks. Right there, how long did that take me? Three minutes, four minutes? 
If you know how to paint a bedroom or a bathroom or paint a set of kitchen cabinets, that's all you have to do. And then you can update that. You can, um, you can refine it as you go, but that is legitimately all that it takes. You know how to do this already. You know how to do this already. This is writing down what is in your head. Just do it. It doesn't have to be perfect. All right. Tony Denhart. Good morning. Dave Cusson, do you have an SOP for subcontractors? Yes, we do. It's not any different than this, though. We actually have an SOP for dealing with subcontractors or the process of uh, dealing with subcontractors as well, too. So Suzanne Hudson, I love how you're making this so simple. I've been painting for 20 years. I've hired a woman to help me and I'm emailing you for your SOPs. It's been a stressful situation mentally for myself teaching her. Thank you so much for your guidance. All right, Suzanne, I, I respect what you're doing. I love what you're doing. But one of the worst pieces of advice that I've ever heard people give in this industry is that if you don't like it or you're not good at it, hire somebody to do it. Listen, folks. You know how to paint and you know how to type. Do it. If you think hiring somebody else who has no idea how to paint, who's going to be better at this than you, you are 100% wrong. Now, Suzanne, I respect that you're taking the, the, the time to do that. But if you want to make this process more complicated and get a lot of stress, hire somebody who says they're good at process documentation and try to teach them this because it is going to be nails on a chalkboard for you. Do it, folks. Do it yourself. Every single human who's watching right now can paint and knows how to type. Do just what I did. Three minutes. Doesn't have to be fancy. Dan Zapanzik. Oh, my man from Canada. One of the Zapanzik brothers, some of my favorite people in the industry. How does your team member access SOPs? Oh, come back here. It got, got shifted down. Electronically, or do they have a binder of printouts? So two things. On all of our jump sheets, there's actually tabs at the bottom that have all of our SOPs at the bottom if they want to reference. We actually print them all out and laminate them and put them in a, not a whole binder, but we put a ring in the corner where they can take them around with that super heavy laminating, the real rigid stuff. Um, and they can, uh, yeah, then they can take them out in the field for quick reference. Mark Polos, one of my favorite people as well. Man, we got a lot of good people watching today. Simplicity is awesome. Absolutely, man. We've known each other for a long time in the industry. We're both fans of it. It's harder than it seems sometimes, but honestly, people will comply with simple systems, which is why I do this. So uh, Gustavo, making it look easy. Folks, listen, you know how to paint and you know how to type. Why is it any more complicated than that? Three minutes for an SOP. That's all it takes, people. Mark Bomba. Thanks for the info. Pretty slick and useful. Thank you. John Milkovich, are your new, oh, just shifted. New construction SOPs, the same idea, just more details. No, it just throws in some steps about, um, it takes a more holistic look at the project where it's like, do all the stain and varnish stuff before you do enameling so that we can seal it all up. It's more things like that. But then you basically insert the processes. When it's time for trim enameling, you use that SOP. When it's time for wall painting, you use that SOP. But it gives you like a a holistic view of how we do new construction. So let's see, Jeremy Fry, do you have an examples of the jump sheet and project plan? Actually, you know what, here, let's pull one up here. Um, do, 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 do. You guys are getting access to my 663 gigabyte drive. <laughs> uh, let's see here, do, 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 do. jump sheet project plan. Let's see what we got here. Yeah, I'll try to find one from an actual job from you guys. So here, let's go to this. You're actually looking at stuff we do in our jobs this month. So, so far, this is what we've done in, in January. Here's an actual jump sheet and project plan. Let me make sure I'm sharing. Oh, wait, sorry guys, I wasn't. Okay, hold tight, sorry. I got a screen share for you here. I'm plowing ahead without showing you guys what I'm doing here, so. Uno momento. Let me make sure I'm sharing what I'm seeing. All right, let's hide. No, stop it. Sorry, guys. This is getting clunky. My, I got so much stuff in the bottom here. So, okay. Let's get back into this here. All right. Come on now. 
All right, so that's the folder for the garage that we did. Sorry, give me one second. I'm making sure I got to flop between two different screens here and make sure it's actually showing up so you guys can see. All right, here we go. You should actually see a. Come on now. Now we have to throw it up on the screen. I normally have all this set before a show, but this is an impromptu request. Bam. Jump sheet. There we go. All right. So this is a jump sheet for a project we did in town. I was the estimator. My project manager, Shane, uh, was the project manager on this one. And you can see up here, this is um, all the hours that auto compute here. Uh, this project was $2,000. And based on our, and let me make sure you're actually seeing this. Yep, there you go. So based on the price, we have a simple calculation that tells us how many hours uh, we should uh, have. So basically, it's a 29 hour job. It looks like uh, our people got it done in 25.25. And we have some notes here, uh, some things. The start time is standard. We didn't have a note access. Sometimes we put a garage code or something. Additional tools required. We're spraying ceilings and walls just to tell them. And then this is a really simplified one. It's the inside of a garage. We're doing the ceiling and the walls. You can see the color here is drift of mist, the same on both. Duration mat on everything. And we need 10 gallons. And they used 11. So this is a way, again, folks, when you're thinking about <laughs> job costing, material and labor, guess what? This is exactly where it all comes from. And you just have to verify that your people are filling it out correctly, but it is all here. It is all here. All right. Uh, Vermont Painter from Instagram, screen share not working. You need to be on Facebook, my friend. You are not going to be able to see a screen share of that on Instagram. I have not found the power to do that yet for you guys. So what we're doing on Facebook is I'm actually showing you a job we did within the last couple of weeks and how this all works. Now you'll see tabs at the bottom. Here's a project plan. And this will take a second to show up. These are kind of uh, heavy, heavy spreadsheets here. They take a while. So you can see exactly Austin was our craftsperson on this, uh, getting ready, prep the garage like this. That took an entire day. You can see the caulking the cracks, all this other stuff. He's charting his time here. There's some touch up, top coat fridge wall, and then deep prep and clean up on the way uh, there. So what they log their hours here and then this automatically it'll compute it for them so when they start playing with numbers here it'll automatically compute and then the good part is we work this sheet to actually kick these hours out to the front up here right here by day so yeah we can see quentin and austin worked on this one quentin must have helped out for a half day give or take on there but yeah that's how we track it all people it's not any more difficult than that uh at the bottom of these things we also have Look at that. Looks familiar, right? We have our SOPs down here for all our interior stuff. Yeah. So it doesn't have to be any more difficult than that, people. It's super, super easy. Um, oh, let's see. Jeremy Fife, hope that helps you. Michael Cheney, does your team access the jump sheet, et cetera, from their phones? Yes, they do. Uh, Dimitri Sevi, straightforward and perfect for onboarding new painters. Absolutely. Frankie Pie, do you include your risk assessments in the back of your SOPs or do you use separate safety statement? No, we have uh, some proprietary safety training that we do for all the people in the company. And then we just verify that the things are getting done that we need to. But honestly, we don't have this, this crazy amount of safety stuff. I mean, yeah. Tony Denhart seems to be very close to what I see from insurance clients. Jeremy Fife Sr. Thank you. Absolutely. All right, everybody. I think that's it. Let me just make sure. Frank's fine finishes. I'm about to job cost this evening, but I don't think it's necessary to see. I lost my ass. <laughs> that's hilarious. No, Frank. <laughs> that's one of the funniest things I've heard in a while, man. So business owners, <clears throat> here, I'm going to pop myself back up on screen here. Business owners deal, we traffic in data plus feelings. Um, the feeling a lot of the times is, boy, I did horrible on this job. But sometimes the data proves you're right. And sometimes the data says, well, you know what? I felt like I lost my tail on that one, but actually it wasn't all that bad. The worst thing that can happen in the data and feeling relationship is I, I run into this all the time, people. Listen, I'm the best painter ever. I charge the most for all my work. My clients wait three years for me to get there. And I'm running a phenomenally good business. I don't need to job cost. I'm rich. And then we'll say, I dare you. 
I dare you to job cost. I dare you to put some of your stuff in here because as a big business owner, I don't want to be punitive. Um, I, I want you to have data plus feelings. I've seen so many people with those feelings go bankrupt or go out of business or have so much stress that they get divorced. I sat around at this conference room table right behind me with craftspeople from all over the country during the year of COVID and we job costed each other's projects. Universally, everybody was basically making about $20 an hour. You could have worked for another painter for more money than you were making in your stuff. So data plus feelings. The worst, the worst version of that is you think you're killing it and you're actually making less than if you were an employee for another company. You're taking on all that risk for nothing. So yeah, that's what it's for. Data plus feelings, everybody. As usual, if you want these things, you email me. I will not respond to Facebook messages. I will not respond to comments here saying, send it to me. And please, people, I'm about to give you 29 years worth of stuff. All I ask for is a review, a recommendation, just to say something nice. Click five stars on the Ask a Painter thing. I'll even send you a link to make it easy for you. Do that for me, folks. It helps me more than you know. It gets this out to more and more people uh, that we uh, that we know and love and dog whistles. So, um. When is the best time, uh, Valentino, to have an employee meetings to go over SOPs? Um, ASAP. Uh, if you're actually talking about a time of the day, that, that's dependent on your company, but ASAP. Start it now. But I will give you guys this. I instituted these all at once in my company. What you want to do is prep people. I take it in three-month increments, which is if you want to create all these SOPs, which probably exist already in your company, they're just not written down, start mentioning it and telling people and prepping people three months ahead of time saying, hey folks, three months from now, your pay and everything is gonna be tied to these standard operating procedures. You're gonna help me create them, we're gonna document them, we're gonna train each other for them, and then we're gonna make sure we're all held accountable, but we're gonna do it over three months. You have three month notice that we need to refine this and make sure everything is really good. That's what you have to do. Uh, Jimmy Coolman, my email address is in the actual show notes of this show. If it hasn't showed up there yet, I will put it in after. So, all right, folks. Who? All right. Amagon, James, what do you do to keep track of job cost? <laughs> Go back one week uh, to Ask a Painter Live. What was it? 293. I did an entire show on it and I'll send you my template if you want it. So, um, all right, folks, here we go. Uh, Amagon James, you guys have to go to Facebook to get my email address. I put it in the show notes over there, nick at nickslavic.com. So, all right, people, um, we got a bunch of fun stuff coming up. Uh, the master's classes for the year, the schedule is, is coming around. Uh, we're, we're, we're getting it set and I'll be traveling the country again, giving exactly this, uh, to people. I have an entire four hour class on these standard operating procedures and how I use them in my business and, uh, data and feelings and everything else. If you want a master's class in your area, I actually have a link uh, in this show where you can contact the PCA and we can get it set up for you. I partner with them on these things to get the good word out. Um, also, we are doing a series of Ask a Painter live retreats this year. Uh, the first one I scheduled is in February. It's a winter retreat at a luxury lodge in uh, Minnesota. It's a private home on a lake. We did this as an experiment last summer and I still think about it every day the quality, the substance of the humans that were there and the things that were discussed legitimately changed away a lot of I think about myself as a person, a human, a father, a husband, and a business owner. And uh, if you guys want that, search it out on Facebook. It's out there. Also, we have a really cool event coming up, the PCA Expo. Um, early March, um, hundreds and hundreds of the brightest minds in our industry, people who I look up to have inspired me, the Annie Newtons, people like that are going to be there. And I'm really, really looking forward to spending time with them. It's a big investment of time and money, but I will guarantee you, you will be blown away. You will be inspired and things will change in your life, both personally and professionally after hanging out with the people there. So I would urge you guys to get out and spend as much time with people, impressive people as you can. It has legitimately changed my life. Five or six years ago, I went to my first expo as a single person painting company we now have 35 people, finishing facility, subcontracting, leadership team, cloud computing, and I have less stress in my life with 35 people than I did with one. So thank you all. I really do appreciate this. We got a great snowstorm yesterday, so I'm going to go shovel out everything with my kids today, do some outdoor stuff as you imagine. And if you want to see a video of some of the coolest, biggest largemouth bass 
in ice water on a frozen lake ever, go to my social media now because I went out spearing yesterday and I did not get any pike, but I watched some of the largest largemouth bass I've ever seen swimming around. So thank you guys. I appreciate this. You guys have a good weekend. Enjoy your family and get out there next week. Job cost SOPs, folks. Let's do this.